The years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free.
came unto the tomb of Jesus. The stone was moved, and he had gone away. The angel said, Fear not, I know who. Before I reach that land and listen to the angels and join their singing band, well, when you see my master in that endless day, well, tell him when you saw me, I was on my way. Well, I tell him when you saw me, I was on my way. I was climbing up that old mountain towards the land of the day. And my face is toward that sunrise and the shadows fall behind. Friend, to tell him when you saw me, I was on my way. Well, I've been tempted by the tester. I've been tested by the foe. You see, I've had my share of troubles, and Satan, he's done me wrong. But when my feet should falter, Jesus heard me pray. So I tell him, when you saw me, I was on my way. Well, I tell him, when you saw me, I was on my way.
this one right here. All the preachers that I ever met would eat all the chicken they could get. They love the breast and they love the thigh. They'd eat chicken till the day they die. Bring that rooster, choke that hen, pluck out the feathers, throw it in a pan, feed it to the preacher and watch him grin. That chicken will never fuck again. Well, when I get to the promised land, that there'll be a big old frying pan. Plenty of chickens running around. For all us preachers that'll be in town. Ring that rooster, choke that hen, pluck out the feathers, throw it in a pan, feed it to the preacher and watch him grin. That chicken will never fuck again. Oh, ring that rooster, choke that hen, pluck out the feathers, throw it in a pan, we'll feed it to the preacher and watch him grin. That chicken will never fuck again. That chicken will never fuck again. I can't get over the grace that I'm under.
grace that I'm under. First mercy of the It's so good to be with you tonight. I know we're doing things a little bit different than what's normal, but I didn't know there's any other way to do anything except something that was different than from normal. So, uh, but I appreciate your indulgence with us as we get all the sound things out where you can hear things. Uh, I don't know if some of you say, well, praise God, I liked it when we couldn't hear you, son. Praise God. I wish you just left it that way. 
But for those of you who you know me well, I am Dennis Benton from a little town in uh, Denver, North Carolina, the Denver of the East, over near Lake Norman. And uh, I'm pastoring a little church. We're having a great little time uh, there, the Northdale Baptist Church in Charlotte near the Metrolina Fairgrounds. We won't be there in a few more months. They sold it. And so as of July the 1st, there'll be no more Metrolina Fairgrounds. Been there over 50 years with all kinds of different things from uh, from carnivals to flea markets, antique sales to car shows. They've had everything in the world there, and it'll be gone in just a, a few more weeks. And so we're right down from there. And we're having a great time at the Northdale uh, Church, Baptist Church. Uh, my youth group starts at age 60. Amen. Isn't that good? And um, we're having a good time with those folks. I told them, I said, praise God, I'm the pastor of the only church in the world that has people who have autographed pictures of Moses at home. And Amen. They said, preacher, if you're going to joke us, get it right. We do not have any autographed pictures of Moses at home. We all have autographed pictures of Abraham. And I said, well, praise God, that's so good. My wife wished she could have been here with us tonight. She wanted to be, but she's a, a, a pianist at uh, Sunset Road Baptist where we're members at, and uh, they were supposed to have rehearsal this afternoon at 5 o'clock. And as she went out the door, she called me just a little while ago while I was in the parking lot, and she said, Honey, I wish I would have known when you left because they called and said we're not having a rehearsal tonight. And I said, Baby, I really hate that because I'd like you to been seen because most of these folks don't really believe I'm married they just think I wear a ring just for the purpose of telling them but I really am married I do have a wife she and I've been married a long time and uh, our son uh, who has graduated from East Carolina now hallelujah him and my money amen I think I was excited that he graduated too but I was glad my money came home amen and so he he's doing good and our daughter uh, we have three grandchildren now I believe since I've seen you last uh, we have Trevor, and he is six years old now. He's our oldest grandson. And then our middle one is Kaysen, and he is three. And then he'll soon be four in October. And then we have Parker, who is a year and a half. So we've got those three little ones, and they are the pride and joy, amen, of Pop Pop's life. We have such a joy. If I'd have had grandchildren first, I'd have never had any children, praise God, because I'm telling you, you that have grandchildren, you know the joy it is that you can give them all the Coke they want, all the Reese's peanut butter cups they'd like to have, praise God, all the jelly donuts they want to have, and sugar them up and send them back to Mom and Daddy. And I love that part. Amen. My daughter told me not too long ago, said, Daddy, you can't do that. I said, Baby, yes, I can. I said, What are you going to do about it? She said, I guess I ain't going to do nothing about it, Daddy. You're going to do what you're going to do. Amen. So her and Scott, my son-in-law, great folks. We love them so. Scott preached for me a couple of weeks ago while I was away. He had just got his master's degree in um, biblical theology. He's going to make a fine pastor one day, and we just love them. They went on their um, anniversary not too long ago, and they, they said, uh, we're going to the mountains, Daddy, and uh, yeah, we're going to leave the babies, with uh, one with you and two with Scott's mom and dad. And my daughter said, Daddy, is there anything we can bring you when we come back from the mountains? I said, yeah, baby, not another baby, baby. Not, a, not another baby. And I said, Lord, I got not another one. I said, you know, Grandpa will be 200 years old helping you put them children through school. I don't need another one. So anyway, but we pastored a little church, and we're having a good time there at Northdale. We have, we've had some exciting things happen. I want to tell you uh, real quick, and then we'll sing a couple more songs for you tonight. I do want to tell you we've had some folks that been saved. We've had some folks that amazing things. I don't know when I was here before if Ellie had given her heart to Jesus. A little Muslim girl, she's 28 years old, just turned 29, and she came Easter a year ago now and invited Christ in her heart and was baptized. And uh, she's uh, just growing in the Lord uh, in church, mo mo almost 95% of the time. Sometimes she's in school, uh, uh, but she's there, sits about where my brother right here sits uh, with some of the ladies, and she's just such a precious thing. Uh, just a miracle of God. That's all I can say, just a miracle of God. She wandered into the church one day, uh, came at the wrong time, came at noon. She ought to know Baptists hadn't got out of church. But then, praise God, but she comes in because she thought they were, you know, mosque is at noon. And so she shows up and comes and tells us that she's not a Christian. And over about a month and a half, we just kind of walked her through the process. And 
give her the, giving her the stuff that she could read and a Bible and, and some other material. And, and when she came that Easter Sunday morning uh, and uh, she said, Preacher, she said, can I get baptized today too? And I said, well, do you have any change of clothes? And she held up her knapsack and she said, I brought my bag of that too. And I'm telling you, people won't get saved, folks. They're going to come get saved. We had a man just a few weeks ago. He called me up on the phone. He didn't know who he was from Adam. He called and said, Preacher, my name is Michael Robinson. He said, I used to come to Northdale when I was a little kid, but I haven't been in church in years. He said, but I woke up this morning, and when I woke up this morning, God spoke to me and said, I have to be in church today. I've got to be in church today. I said, well, praise the Lord. We're looking forward to having you. So I was in Ashboro. My associate, Terry Lurson, was there. And I didn't call Terry and tell him because... Uh, Pastor Steve will tell you he's had hundreds of telephone calls from folks said, uh, Preacher, I'm coming to church today. And sure enough, uh, they don't come. And so we've just learned to wait and see if you come in the door, amen, before we rejoice. Well, Michael came, and uh, he's a rough-looking character, but I tell you, he's a good boy, good boy. And he come through the door with his little seven-year-old daughter. And uh, on Wednesday night, Terry, my associate, led him to the Lord. Uh, because he called him on the phone to check and see if he's coming to church. And he said, well, before I come to church, he said, I need to, I need to get saved, Terry. He said, I'm just telling you. He said, I need to know Jesus as my Savior. So they came the next Sunday morning. He popped out about halfway down the aisle, come down. And he said, I'd like to invite Jesus in my heart. And I said, okay, did you pray with Terry? He said, yeah. I said, do you understand? Yes. And um, I'll tell you, church, this is what will really keep you pastor and keep you when you get tired and wore out and you think that you're ready to give in and give up. This is what will change your heart altogether because after the service, his little daughter Chloe, about seven years old, was sitting over here on the left side of the church, sitting beside some of our ladies in the church who sit with the kids. And so she uh, looked up at, at Miss Brenda and said, you know why my daddy did what he did today in this church? She said, no, honey, I don't know why. She said, well, over the years we visited lots of churches we hadn't been in church in a long time, but we visited lots of churches. said, but this is the only church that accepted me and my daddy when we came. Oh, my. I thought, preachers, preachers, preachers. There's a lot of you missed out on the greatest blessing in the world, leading somebody to Christ. Now, I'm telling you, Michael's a rough-looking boy. He's about 35 years old, and he is rough-looking. Looks like he's lived a tough life, and he has. He's had some surgery. He had, a, had some brain surgery. He has a scar from one side of his head to the other. And he don't look like me and you. But you know what? Praise God, I'm glad he don't look like me. I'd like him to look like you, but I'm glad he don't have to look like me. But you know what? I've learned one thing. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And all we've got to do is get them to the cross, and Jesus will take care of them. Old Michael came, we put him in the baptismal pool, about froze him to death. Tony, I'm telling you, we did. My deacon chairman and my baptismal team forgot to fill up the baptismal waters. And then they realized at about 9.30, we have service at 11. You ever tried to fill up a 500-gallon tank in an hour and a half and get it warm? It ain't possible. I'm telling you, it ain't possible. Michael didn't care. He got out in that ice cold water and he said, Preacher, it's cold in here. I said, Son, hang on, you won't be here long. I put him in, put him out, and pitched him up the stairwell. And they met him and his teeth went chattering down the other side. And he came out and we stood before the people. I said, Well, how do you feel, brother? I said, uh, how that baptismal water was cold, wasn't it? He said, yes, it was, preacher. He said, but I do tell you this. If there was a demon in me, preacher, praise God, we froze him out today. <laughs> So all kind of things are happening in the little church. I can say when I was here before, I told you we had about 25 little folks when I went there. We're running about 50 now. God's good all the time and all the time. God is good, and he's doing some great things in our life and our ministry. Uh, so I'm excited about all that we are having an opportunity to accomplish for his glory. We just uh, look, Can I tell you one more story before I sing something else? i got to tell you one more. This was just such a blessing. We were on a cruise in January. While y'all was here freezing to death, we was there uh, enjoying the warm weather on our way to the Bahamas. And um, so the football game was coming on that afternoon. The, the Panthers were playing later in the day. New England and Denver were playing that afternoon. 
We had a room that would hold about 250 people. The Anchorman Quartet were with us, Fortify Trio, and a whole lot of other singers. We had 92 people who went on the trip with us. But we packed out the room every, every day, about 250 to 300 people every day for the program. God's good. Well, they came to us and said, look, we need to switch rooms with you. Said, y'all going to drown out the football game because all the bank of the TVs are outside the forum lounge where you are. Would you trade with us for the bigger lounge in the front? It holds about 900 people. They said, we'll give you a, our lighting engineer, our backstage man, our sound man, and everything. It won't cost you a penny if you'll just allow us to change. I said, we'll do that under one condition. I said, if you'll make an announcement, which they normally don't do, for all over the ship to let people know that we're having Sunday service in the big lounge. Now, folks, I want to tell you, honest before the Lord, as I stand here, if I had to die with my hand up, for 12 years I have taken these gospel cruises, and I've asked God all of those 12 years if just one day that we could sing and do a service in the big theater, the big theater. So that afternoon when I walked up on that stage, I said, God, you've made my dream come true. We're in this big theater today. Folks, they made the announcement, and almost 500 people came to the service that day. When I got up and preached a little message after the, all the singers had sung, and I said, well, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but you know what? I got to answer to God. I don't have to answer to Carnival Cruise Line. I said, I'm going to ask all the preachers that are in the house if they'll come and stand around the front of this stage that we're converting into an altar today. And I said, I'm going to ask you, all of you, all over this building tonight, if you need to come and pray or need to invite Christ to come in your heart or you've got a burden on your heart, I'm going to invite you to come. I said, the men are going to begin to sing, and as they begin to sing, I'm going to invite you to come. Nine preachers got up and came and covered the front of that, what I call, altar or stage. And in just a few moments, unbelievable to me, people got up from all over that building. And I looked down, and the, all nine preachers had somebody praying with them. A couple of minutes later, I looked down again, and there was nine more people there. And they left. And then nine more people came, and they left. A lady came in the back door and stood there then got to the stairs, then got to the aisle, and ran down to the altar to pray. The lady sitting back in the audience, one of the preachers, got her. she got his attention, Brother Sammy Thompson, and Sammy goes back to where she is and says, Ma'am, why are you bawling so? I mean, I'm not talking about little tears. I'm talking about crocodile tears, honey. And she was just a bawling. They got into a conversation. She said, I got a terrible burden on me got terrible guilt, a past I can't run away from. He said, well, I'll tell you, you, you can't run no more. God take care of it right now. She said, can he really? He said, well, let's pray and just ask him. So he began to pray and she began to pray. In a few moments, she looked up at him and he looked at her. And he said, how do you feel now, honey? He said, my burden is gone, my guilt's gone, and I can live again. Amen. You can do that. Did you know you could do that on a carnival cruise ship out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? Sure you can. My God's everywhere. Amen. He's not just in a box. He's not right here only in this church. He's everywhere all the time, even there. Thirty-one people came and did business with God. I was so excited, I could have flown back home. I didn't need to ride that ship. But it was so wonderful to see. The rest of the week, people would stop the singers, or me or somebody, and says, thank you for the service, Sunday preacher. Thank you for the service. Now, let me tell you one last thing. Of the 31 people who came and prayed, only one was from the group that we had brought with us. The other 30 were people that we had no idea who they were. And you know why that can happen? It's not because of what I can do. It's what God can do. Because he's still in the business of taking that which is broken, making it something unbelievable. Listen to this song. Searching through the ashes of the person that I was. When devastation came, I found my strength was not enough. 
light should shining on a hill through tears my eyes could see that along this path I saw that there were others just like me broken vessels just like me God builds churches with broken people with hurting people with searching people somehow these imperfect people find strength to make it through and the broken become brand new We have come from everywhere, from every walk of life. Each one beneath the traveler's load of pain or guilt or strife. We have come to see his face and in his life to bow. For with shattered dreams and broken hearts and yet with his hand somehow. With God's loving hand, somehow, God builds churches with broken people, with hurting people, with searching people, and somehow these imperfect people find strength to make. And become brand new. And somehow these imperfect people find strength to make it. the broken become brand new and the broken become brand new and let's just prayerfully sing that great chorus to the Lord one more time. God is so good. 
God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. The best verse of all. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Well, I like hearing you sing. That's the way we used to do it in the old days when we didn't have a piano and organ, didn't have a iPad that didn't play correctly tonight. We just worshiped by opening our mouth and letting her sing. I just imagine real quickly how Jesus and them on the boat, as they would sing and talk and fellowship together, how the acoustics of that great water would just fan out the message and song just like we just did sing without any instruments tonight here as we get ready to close. And I pray tonight that as you leave from this place that if anything that we've said or done that could help you understand just two things. Number one, we have a God who loves you. Not just me, but He loves you as well. He loves us all just like we are. And God takes those of us who have been broken and cast aside and pushed to the side and He collects up those pieces and puts us all back together again into a magnificent masterpiece. So I want you to know tonight God loves you. He loves you. And number two, He's looking out for you. I preached a message in this pulpit some time back. God is thinking about you. And I hope you'll remember that God is looking out for you and He's thinking about you. It still boggles my mind when I read that scripture in Psalms 40:17 that though I may be poor and needy, the Lord is thinking about me. The God who made all of everything has time to think about you. Can you imagine that? That all day, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, God has you on his mind. Individually. God has you on his mind. God has you on his mind. 
God has me on his mind. I don't understand it. But one day I'll get to know it. Amen. Because one day when we walk those pearly, through those pearly gates and walk on that street made of pure gold and we walk right up to heaven, it'll be a magnificent time together. Let's pray together. Father, it's been such a good time in your house tonight. Lord, we know the devil, he always wants to mess something up. But Lord, even in the midst of him trying to mess it up, God, you still showed up anyhow. God, you still ministered to us. God, you still let the songs be sung. You still, still let the message be proclaimed. You still let your spirit drop by and touch us with an anointing of your love in this place. You still have encouraged some that needed encouragement tonight. Lord, you've still given some the hope that they were looking for tonight. You've still given some a touch of your divine power tonight that have come this way. And Lord, we thank you so much for doing that. Now, Lord, in these moments to, of invitation tonight, we're just going to ask you that if he'd be your will and your way, if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that tonight that'll be the glad hour that they come to know Jesus as Lord. There may be some here struggling, Lord, with difficulties of life. Some of them are facing some health issues. Some of them are facing some debt issues. Some of them are facing emotional issues. Some are just facing life itself. And they need to come and kneel around this altar and do a little business with you. And I pray, Father, as they do that tonight, that, Lord, that you would bless in a very, very special way. Now, Lord, I pray that you'd take us and that you'd use us and, Lord, you'd allow your presence to be in the midst of us. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, if you need to come tonight, you come. As God speaks to your heart in these moments, as we gather around the altar together, as we share this last song here with you tonight, you step out if you need to. Today I went back to the place where I used to go. Today I saw that same old crowd that I knew before. And when they asked me what had happened, I tried to tell them, thanks to Calvary, I don't come here anymore. Thanks to Calvary, I am not the man I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, things are different than before. And as the tears ran down my face, I tried to tell them, thanks to Calvary, I don't come here. Anymore. Maybe you need to come tonight. Maybe you need to come. Maybe there's somebody on your heart tonight that you just need to come and pray for. Maybe there's somebody in the building tonight that you just look around and you say, I know that they're having a tough time. And God, I'm not going to point them out, but I'm going to come and I'm going to lift them up. That's what we do at church, you know, we lift them up. Maybe you're here and you know somebody that's lost a loved one in the last few days and you just want to step out and come and pray for them. I pray you'll do that in these moments. For thanks to Calvary, I am not the man I used to be. Thanks to Calvary, things are different than before. 
And as the tears ran down my face, I tried to tell them, thanks to Calvary, I don't come here anymore. Well, church, it's not about me, and it's not about you. It's all about Calvary. You know, in just a couple of days, during this Easter week, We'll experience all of the things as we prepare our hearts for next Sunday for celebration of Resurrection Day. I'm so excited that we'll experience it. On Friday, we'll think about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. On Saturday, we'll think about Him being in the tomb. But hallelujah, on Sunday, we'll rejoice that we serve a risen Savior. He's no longer there, folks. He's seated right now, tonight, at the right hand of God, making intercession for you and for me. He said he'd leave the Holy Spirit to live within our hearts. That would encourage us. And I trust that you'll celebrate this week in such a way that people will wonder what's wrong with you. They'll go, what's wrong with you? Hey, didn't you know Resurrection Sunday is coming on Sunday? It's Easter. The Lord Jesus is alive. You do better than that. The Lord Jesus is alive. And we need to rejoice. Folks, people have seen Christians in this day and time that are quiet and calm and milk toast and don't say much. But you know what? It's time for the people of God to stand up and say, I serve a risen Savior. I serve a risen Savior. My Savior is not in a tomb. Let me tell you one last thing and I'm going to pray. The one thing that little Ellie, my used-to-be Muslim girl, said. I said, what made the difference? She said, as a Muslim, I could never, ever receive forgiveness of my sin. Especially being a woman, she'd never receive. Men can, women can't. She said, but with Jesus... He can forgive me of my sin, and I can learn how to forgive others. Now, folks, we need that kind of testimony in all our lives today. Jesus loves us, and I can learn how to love others. He forgives us, I can learn to forgive others. So I pray tonight that as we go through this place, the same as the great pastor who stands behind this desk every Sunday, I'm sure encourages you to know that through those doors is the greatest mission field and all the world. And you are the only Bible that some people will ever read. I pray tonight as we pray and leave tonight and go our separate ways until God brings us back together again. I beg of you and pray of you that you give them the best translation of the Bible in your life that they possibly can read. I trust you'll do that. Father, we thank you tonight for this privilege that's been ours to be able to sing and share and fellowship with some of the greatest people in the world. Lord, we've had the privilege to sing at Altamaha Baptist Church. We've had the privilege to preach. We've had the privilege just to be here in the presence of your Holy Spirit tonight. And I pray, God, that we will be the people, oh, Lord, that you have chosen to be as a beacon light in this community, that when people come by this church, Lord, they'll be strangely stirred to say there's something going on there. There's something going on. And that something that's happening around here is that Jesus is being glorified and Jesus is being edified, not only in the church, but in the lives of the people that come here. Now, Lord, as we leave from this place, I pray, God, tonight that you would bless us. Lord, that you'd watch over us. And, Lord, you'd grant us safe journey and mercies to our destinations and our homes. I pray for uh, Brother Tucker tonight. Lord, as you continue to mend him, I pray that you'd bless him in a very special way. Lord, I pray you bless his wife as she helps to care and encourage him. And I pray, God, that you bless this church. 
For, Lord, there's great things that are going to come from this place because of a people who are seeking to do the things that you have chosen them to do. Now, dismiss us in your love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you, folks.